Good evening. Welcome. Welcome many, many people here. Wonderful to see how many people actually have come tonight, and especially at this strange, strange day. Um, yeah, what, what word can I use to describe this day? Um, when we organized this event, we thought about that, that it's climate change itself would be urgent enough to, to talk about, but today it got an extra dimension of urgency, and so I think it's very important that we're all here together and to explore what it means for us to live in a world with Trump and climate change. Um, we have an American uh, scholar with us today, Renee Lersman, she's a psychoanalyst, and um, well, I think she's the best person to have with us today to explore what it actually means and how we can deal with these feelings of maybe overwhelm, ambivalence, and anger. I don't know. Um, tonight we will have first, like the first hour, we will explore uh, what the field of eco psych psychology um, can can bring us in how to think about apathy and how to think about how to break through it. Afterwards we will have a break and then we will have a panel discussion with Princess Irene, which I'm very happy she's with us today. Um, Pelle Berting from civil society, like Greenpeace and the Dutch climate movement. Imre Ploeg, who's like a conductor, and he will explore how music can help us to break through apathy, and with Manu Buschot from Klimaatgesprekken, or Carbon Conversations, on how we can actually talk in a different way about these issues. Um, my name is Eva Novak. I work here as a program maker, and I, uh, um, well, this, this question has been like one of the biggest questions of my life for, for the last eight years. Um, I was an ambassador of change with WWF, and I had to bring change, but I really didn't know how. So um, I hope tonight we will explore how we can think differently in how to bring about change in this world. Brené, I would love to invite you. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Thank you, Yvonne, so much for inviting me to this amazing event. So, um, so I'm really touched and honored to be here and to see all of you here on this cold, rainy evening. Um, I, as you can imagine, um, am feeling a lot of things right now. And um, it's a very peculiar time to be giving a lecture or a talk in a foreign country, right? I mean, on the one hand, it's like, what an incredible moment to be out of my country. It's disorienting. Um, I feel a little bit... Um, a little bit in shock, to be honest. And, you know, I really feel that it's important for all of us to just sort of be okay with what we're feeling right now and how we're feeling. Um, and that's actually a big piece of what it is that I want to share with you this evening. So um, before I get into talking about some ideas and some ways that I hope can be helpful for us to think about our relationship with the world and in particular with climate change, environmental issues, and how we work with others around that. Um, I want to just first begin with, with an invitation um, for us as a group here tonight to check in with ourselves um, around how we're feeling right now. How we're feeling right now. And what I want to really clarify here is see if we can check in with how we're feeling without any judgment about that feeling, without any evaluation. Often we, you know, if we're feeling kind of distressed or uncomfortable or upset, we, you know, we're, we're often wishing or feeling like we shouldn't be having those feelings and it's because it's not comfortable, right? And we try to get out of that as quickly as possible. And part of what I am looking at tonight with you is a different way of relating with the experience of being with what is, being with what is actually happening, and not to be afraid of that, because that's actually where we draw so much of our power and so much of our energy as human beings is precisely our capacity to absolutely feel what is happening and then move on, right? And then move. But when we skip over that piece, we're not as fully 
human and hu fully present as we can be. So I'm, I'm sensing kind of how I'm feeling. I'm feeling vulnerable and, um, as I shared, a little bit disoriented, but also excited to be here with you in this precious time that we have together on this evening with amazing colleagues and collaborators. Um, so I'd like to just take a couple of minutes and, and see if um, any of you would like to just kind of shout out or, or speak how it is that you are feeling right now. It could just be one or two words that might kind of capture that. So it's, the, it's open, open to, the, to the group. Scared. Scared, okay. So maybe if you want to say something because we are streaming tonight, um, so it's best to, st to stand up and then I will come and we can uh, speak in a mic. So raise your hand, please. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, scared and grateful because of all of you. Thanks. Um, I think I feel sad, but I think at the same time, um, the reason I came here, like I, I, I didn't, I didn't plan. Can I say more? You can. <laughs> I, why? Sad, you, what brought you sad here? Sad but hopeful. Yeah. Let's say. Let's say. Right. <laughs> it's. It's great to hear what brought you here, what attracted you to the to the evening. All right. I feel frustrated and rebellious. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're doing an uh, experiment with Earth, and it's very Im unpredictable. And, and we're actually doing it, while actually we shouldn't do it at all, but it's like, experiment is starting. I uh, feel the pain of loss for you know, future biodiversity, so I feel that pain uh, pretty harsh. I feel um, kind of hopeless uh, and troubled. Mm -hmm. I'm actually feeling quite hopeful, especially given the fact that meetings like this are being organized, so I'm really optimistic. Mm -hmm. I feel like an alien. I feel quite confused and I'm very happy to hear that other people are hopeful because I hope that hopefulness will transfer to me this evening. Mm -hmm. In the back. Oh. I feel like we have to fight and I hope you have been able to vote unless you're yep. here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel loved because all of the people here share the same problems that I feel. Mm -hmm. I feel an inner act to urge really deeply. An inner, what was that? Uh, what did I say? In, did inner say urge. An inner like, urge. Yeah, okay. to act, yeah. Um, in terms of feelings, kind of numb and sort of sick, like nauseous, uh, but also when I saw this event on Facebook, I felt I absolutely have to be here. This is the question. I have to be here and glad to be in this community. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So thank you for that. I just would like to draw our attention to what it was like for you to hear um, we, some, some folks already mentioned what it was like just to hear what other people we're sharing and recognize that that in itself, hearing how other people are doing is very powerful, right? And it actually can influence and shift how we're feeling in relation to that. But one of the, one of the most powerful things as we'll hear about um, probably later around conversation is what happens when we share our experience. And the, the really important thing I wanna um, highlight is that whatever it is that we are experiencing is, is, is okay. 
So there's a, a very powerful tendency to, um, to privilege and prioritize more kind of positive feelings like hopefulness and optimism and, and, and you know, feeling efficacy and to feel that being scared and, and numb and whatever is bad. And, and, and in actuality, as I mentioned, it's really uh, the full human spectrum, right? And this is really important. This is actually an incredibly important piece to help us understand and work with as we move forward around the events that we're living in today. Um, so I want to um, I want to just start with sharing a poem by an American poet that a friend shared with me today, and it really struck me as quite relevant. There are those who are trying to set fire to the world. We are in danger. There is time only to work slowly. There is no time not to love. And that's uh, Dina Metzger. Um, and there's, there's actually a lot in that that I want us to invite us to think about, which is there are those who want to set fire to the world. We're in danger. There is no time to not act, right? There's no time to act uh, slowly is what she's saying. And what this means, the way I understand this, is that it's an opportunity for us to think about how we can be active and be agents of change and at the same time allow for what it means to act slowly what it means to reflect, what it means to connect, what it means to listen and interact with one another in new and um, creative ways, and to, and to love. So I want to um, begin with just clarifying a little bit about um, why I'm standing here and what, what this, is, this work is about for me. So um, basically, about 20 years ago, I was learning about environmental issues as a university student, and I was experiencing a lot of trauma around that experience. And I was also taking psychology courses, and I was very um, puzzled why these worlds were not more connected. And that bewilderment, how on earth could we talk about environmental issues and what's going on with how humans are relating and acting on the planet, it seems so bizarre to me that that study and understanding wouldn't be connected with understanding the human being, the human behavior, human psychology. You know, why is this happening? But not only why is this happening, but, but what can we do about it? And how can we communicate more effectively? So for, for a number of years now, I've really focused quite specifically on trying to understand what specifically we can learn from psychological uh, studies and science and practice. And so what I'm sharing with you is sort of an a incredible distillation of um, some highlights of what I hope can be helpful for us. Um, and, and I just want to clarify that my interest in drawing from psychology, and particularly psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic psychology, meaning that I'm really excited to learn from people who work with other people, right? So it's not to put down psychological research that happens, you know, not with live people in an interaction, but that there are insights that are, are gained from those who have had the, the experience of working directly with human beings around behavior change and what it means to be human being. You know, how we make sense of our lives, how we make meaning, how we cope with, with uh, trauma, how we cultivate resilience. And so what I'm sharing is what I see as um, really powerful resources that we need urgently right now, urgently right now. So my fantasy is that we all leave this room tonight with a sense of uh, excitement and encouragement to go out and connect with the people who we know who are psychological practitioners and ask them, you know, what do you think? Take a look at what I'm, you know, if you're working in campaigns, if you're working in communications, education, your student, whatever your background, to engage with understanding what, is, what can we learn from the psychology of these issues. 
So in thinking about, whoops, here we go. In thinking about sort of how to orient um, the, the way, a way to, to think about um, where we are right now, there's three kind of main questions that I've proposed that we meditate on or reflect on. And one is, how do we live with the knowledge of climate change? So the language that I'm using here, how do we live with the knowledge of climate change, is very deliberate, because I'm not asking how do people, what do people believe about climate change, or what are people's attitudes or opinions. I'm asking about how do we live with the knowledge. So what does it mean to be a human being right now and live with the awareness of what's happening? What does it mean to be a human being living right now? So this is this kind of existential question that I, I'm guessing that many of us in this room are, uh, have been wrestling with. Maybe not on a fully conscious level, but in the background, once you become really kind of tuned in to what's happening, I think it's hard not to have this kind of existential question come up. What does it mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like to be a human being right now? And I notice there's quite a few young people in the room. There's, there's lots of ages, which is great, but there's young folks, young people who, um, you know, I, I remember when I was younger, that, that sense of urgency of how do I live my life? How do I live my life knowing what I know that's in alignment with what I know, but yet at the same time, we're still living kind of embedded in systems that are quite problematic, right? So how do we, how do we live, how do we embody this? And the third question, which I think is really the one that is absolutely on our minds, right, is kind of the million dollar question. How do we ignite our creativity and our imagination? How do we do that? How do we, how do we tap the human capacity to respond to our crises with the creativity, the resilience that we all know that we have as human beings, but how do we ignite that? So I did address some of these questions in my book, Environmental Melancholia, and the book is based on interviews I did with people living in a very industrialized part of the United States who appeared to be apathetic. And what I found in doing these interviews with people is that underneath the apathy, underneath the I really couldn't care less or I can't be bothered or don't waste my time, underneath that was a profound sense of care and concern about what was happening. But it was really um, laden. It was full of a sense of loss. And the loss that I was hearing was something that's very, um, not very clear. Right? It was a, a vague loss of an earlier time, a time when things were simpler, a time when my parents and their parents had a different kind of life, a time when seasons weren't affected. Right? So there was this kind of what I saw as a melancholia, which I argue in the book is one of the primary reasons that more people are not engaging and activated about environmental issues is because when there's a sense of something that's lost and yet we feel that there's not a lot that we or I can do about it, we want to protect ourselves, right? We want to we wanna manage that feeling. So the idea of environmental melancholia is simply an attempt to reframe how we think about the reasons why people may not be doing more on behalf of the environment, okay? And, and what I'm talking about here are primarily those who are sort of in that middle range. Like, um, you know, I'm not talking about um, people who work directly in, in frontline kind of industrial um, extract. I'm talking about the majority of humans who know something's up, are concerned about it, and yet not are quite paralyzed around what to do about it. And a lot of the talk that I've experienced, I've worked in the environmental sector for years, and a lot of the, the language that's used is how do we educate people? How do we motivate people? How do we raise awareness about these issues? And what I found is that those ways of thinking about it are not necessarily helpful 
They're not necessarily appropriate because it's not necessarily about motivating, educating, and raising awareness. It's how we educate. It's how we motivate. It's how we raise awareness in ways that people can actually kind of come to terms with. So I hope, I hope I'm making sense. Um, we'll have lots of time for questions and discussions as well. So the question is, how can psychology help us navigate this terrain? And I came up with a, um, something that I call a quadrant. It's a map of currently kind of approaches that, that are happening in the climate movement that are ways into a, kind of unlocking, activating people, engaging, motivating. So the first part of this quadrant is what I call sort of a, it's like a behavior change focus. So how do we, have you, any of you familiar with nudging, the nudge, or um, levers and drivers, that language that's very kind of tool-like, comes right out of behavioral economics, which is a very kind of tool orientation, cost-benefit analysis, incentives. Let me give you a rebate, let me give you some money, let me give you, uh, in, you know, an incentive to, help, to make you want to do something. So that's the kind of thinking that's often very prevalent in government programs as well. You know, how do we change people's behavior? Is that a phrase that's common here, behavior change? So the second focus is, is how do we frame the message? So um, any of you familiar with George Marshall's work? Um, George Marshall. So it's this idea that how, we, how the language we use and the framing is what's going to get people on board. So you use word, what kind of words do you use? Pollution, carbon emissions, tax, fee, you know, it's, it's a sensitivity to framing, right? The third kind of main focus is on social design. So social innovation, we have to design a better world. Any of you kind of coming from that orientation as designers maybe, innovators, kind of systems level changing, that, that recognize that we, you know, we, we, need to, we need to spark innovation, right? We need to catalyze innovation. And the third part of this quadrant is the emotional side, right? It's the emotional dimension. How are we emotionally engaged? And, you know, a clue when you're kind of in this part of the landscape is you're, you're hearing more about conversation, like carbon conversations. You're, you're asking questions like, how do we create participatory experiences for people, right? So this map potentially can be helpful for you as you're out there kind of in the world, kind of in this terrain, you might notice like a language or a framework and okay, you know, that's that behavior change, behavioral economics, Dan, you know, Kahneman, thinking fast and slow, whatever. And I, and I want to be very clear that we need all of these parts of the quadrant, but we really need them working much more together than they currently are. And naturally, you might have guessed that I'm very interested in this part of the quadrant because this is the part that is least understood currently and is actually the, you know, I would say the most <laughs> urgently needed as we have seen by events today. Okay, so one way to look at events like today, one way that I look at this, thanks to um, you know, mentors I've had in training and more psychodynamic, psychoanalytic work applied to social phenomenon is about affect, A-F-F-E-C-T, affect. You know, it's, it's about how people manage uncertainty and fear and vulnerability and feeling out of control and feeling powerless, and feeling that they don't have any efficacy, feeling angry, ripped off, right? I mean, this is what has given rise to, largely, to what's happened right now. Affect is very powerful. And no matter how much we want to give, you know, put the information out, you know, as long as we're not acknowledging and finding really skillful ways to work with the feeling that's associated with climate change and with global, the kind of global ecological threats that we're dealing with, our work is quite limited, it's quite impaired, okay? Are you, are you all with me so far? I hope. 
Okay. So when we think about affects and feelings, some of the things that, that tend to come up are, you know, we despair and shame and guilt and conflict and powerlessness. And, you know, I just randomly threw these up because, you know, I've been around enough people, you know, humans are not that unique. You know, there, you can kind of find some common themes that come up everywhere I speak all around the world that these things are very common. And so I'm really inviting us in a way to reframe or rethink our relationship with these feelings. Not that we want to stay in these feelings, but we want to relate with these things with, with some compassion, right? To re recognize that what it means to come to terms with what we call climate change is really about rethinking what it means to be a human being right now. And that includes rethinking all the ways that we create who we are, right? Our identity, our, our way of life. I'm not saying our way of life is, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying going extreme here. I'm saying that if we take the climate change threat seriously, it's very hard to not go there in terms of what am I doing? I'm not doing enough. And the fact is, is that those feelings, these affects are very, um, very distressing and very hard for humans to tolerate. Very, very hard. And what happens when we have this stuff come up on a less conscious level is we tend to defend. And that's exactly what we see happening is people avoiding and splitting. Splitting is a term in psychoanalysis where you split the world into good and bad. I mean, I've never seen a politician as blatantly demonstrating splitting as Trump. It was just mind-blowing to see it on national TV, someone very much in a split world who's reflecting a splitting consciousness happening, right? So why does this matter? Let's say you're trying to educate people, trying to inform people in your, in your life, in your, um, your colleagues, your friends, your family, or maybe you're an educator. Affect, what we know now from neuroscience, is that affect directs our attention, it guides decision-making, stimulates learning, and triggers behavior. And so I'm, I'm sharing this because I want us to get very clear that when we're talking about climate change, it's very affectively laden. It's not just a straightforward, here we're gonna show you some, and we actually had a whole discussion about whether to share a clip with you all tonight from a film um, by Josh Fox about climate change, a wonderful documentary that has very powerful imagery about, you know, what's happening, right? The images that might come to mind for you, right? Flooding, fires, um, ice melting, right? And so we had a very, uh, really robust discussion. Is that, you know, how, should we show this or not? My concern that, you know, we're talking about the fact that a lot of this is very, um, it can be kind of traumatizing, right? And that's okay, I'm not, I'm not saying we don't need documentaries, but again, I'm wanting us to think about how we can be sensitive, sensitive, and I'll talk about that in a minute, what that might look like, to be sensitive about how we work with this material so that we're able to bring more people along with us. We're able to really, you know, make the tent as big as possible. So another uh, important insight that's from a colleague of mine, uh, Marshall Alcorn, is if a mind thinks of new information and in that moment experiences anxiety, fear, anger, or shame, that new information may not be effectively integrated. So think about that. Think about that. That we're actually literally cognitively not able to take in what might be triggering these feelings. And, and then this is a comment around uh, defense mechanisms, which is really, I think, a, a secret weapon of insight that we can use in our work in the climate movement is really understanding defense mechanisms on a very deep, very uh, nuanced level. That if confronted with some new information that doesn't fit with our models, we will rely on defense mechanisms to deny, repress, or confabulate anything to preserve the status quo. So does this, does this sound familiar to you? Does this sound like a description of what we see the majority of people engaging in right now? This is defense mechanisms. It's not, I'm going to really be pushed back on this idea that it's that people don't care, people are apathetic. 
really we're talking about the fact that this is really stuff that brings up a lot of conflict. So one of the things I think is important to recognize about environmental issues and, and climate change is the kinds of conflicts it can bring up in, in us between, they, they are not necessarily real conflicts. They might be imagined conflicts. Do you know what I mean? Like they may not be ground, like grounded in reality, but people may imagine if I change my life or do something, then I'm losing my, you know, it, it threatens my identity as a good partner, or a mother, or a parent. What am I, you know, what are people going to think of me? Those are imagined conflicts, right? I have conflict about flying a lot, right? I don't take flying lightly at all. So I'm actively trying to work with this conflict and, you know, I fly much less than I normally do. But we all have our ways to kind of manage and, and relate with this. And so what happens with conflict is we have denial, which we're going to talk about later. So denial is a very, very well-known, one of the most basic defense mechanisms that we know about the human psyche. Carrie Norgard, um, an American um, sociologist who is also Norwegian, did a wonderful study called Living in Denial where she studied a community in Norway and looked at how denial is socially produced. It's not something that an individual has. I kind of need you to be in denial with me, if that makes sense. It's, it's a social <coughs> production, and this goes back in a way to why conversation is one of the most radical things we could do right now is to create context for people to have conversation. Because when you're not speaking, uttering what's true, you're actually creating um, a sort of a, a dissociation or a denial, if that makes sense. Um, disavowal is really interesting, where um, you, you choose to sort of know and not know, so it's not the same as denial. Denial is literally saying there is no climate change, and disavowal is saying I'm actually going to just not be aware of that right now and continue to eat or fly or whatever it is. So you're not denying it, but you're also not acting on it. You're in that kind of disavowal space. And rationalizing is, you know, super common. So these are human things. We all do them. Every single one of us do these all the time. So they're not bad. But imagine if we really started working with these as tools in our climate work, we might be able to understand and make sense of what's actually going on with people when we try to have conversations or try to work and there's just kind of a wall. And there's really some amazing things that we can do to meet that. So it's not hopeless. It's not hopeless at all. In fact, it's incredibly, um, you know, there's incredible <laughs> opportunity for us to draw on um, resources that, um, that the folks who are going to be, we're all going to be sitting up here, will, are actively working with right now. So, where are we? So, I, I did want to include some artwork. This is an American artist who um, is a scientist, and she calls her work glaciogenic art. So, all of her work is generated from data that she's collected in the field. So, it's really, it's really wonderful. And one of the reasons I include art and imagery is precisely getting to this question of how do we cope with this? How do we relate with this? And some of you may be aware that the role of art, and um, it's wonderful we have an artist with us tonight, the role of art we need more than ever right now. It's, it's like so powerful precisely because it can sort of occupy that space where we may not have words and we might be struggling to make sense. Um, artists and our experience of art and our ability to create and to produce as creative beings can be one of those most powerful ways for us to, to relate and process and connect with people. So, okay. Um, so I wanna kinda wrap things up here in a bit. So, so I work primarily as a consultant, which means that I have to translate this work in ways that really um, can be applied for people who don't have a lot of time and have to kind of make things happen. And so one of the things I've come up with as a way to kind of distill some of this that I hope might be useful for you is what I call the three A's. 
And the three A's, the idea of the three A's is that it's, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a way of tuning into where people are at and having more empathy for the people that we're trying to connect with um, in relation to climate and environmental issues. So the first A is anxiety. And a lot of us have anxiety, right? Um, Freud wrote about anxiety as the basic, basis of human condition. But we're talking about climate anxiety. We're talking about ecological anxiety. We're talking about uh, incredible issues that are very, can feel very scary. And so um, recognizing that anxiety is often in the mix and learning and practicing, listening and paying attention to where the anxiety might be. And ambivalence is the second A, which is that a lot of people are feeling, you know, the, this term ambivalence really torn between, I want to do good for the planet, I want to be part of the solution, but I really don't want to give up this, right? I really, that's ambivalence where there's really a tension. And it's a real tension, it's not a, um, a cop out. You know, I think we can be very harsh on ourselves and on others. It's not a cop out, it's really understandable that we would have these tensions. So listening to where the ambivalence is, right? And, um, and, and, and recognizing that ambivalence is actually one of the most powerful barriers to engagement that we have. And aspiration is that where we all want to focus. We all want everyone to feel motivated and inspired to take action. And so that's there too, right? And I believe that every human being has some aspiration there. And it's up to us to, to, to hear that and tap into it and bring it out. But my point, let's see. Yeah, okay. So my point is that we need to really, in order to get to the aspiration, we need to, to develop ways of working with the anxiety and the ambivalence. And one of the most powerful ways to do that is through conversation and through practicing. It's, it's good conversation. I don't have time to go into it. And, um, you know, you're all welcome to be in touch with me later. I love talking about this. But the, um, there's tools that we can learn from carbon conversations, from motivational interviewing. The, the, the essence of a good conversation, what I mean by that, is that we learn to listen first and talk and tell second. So um, normally I have cartoons and animation because, again, I'm kind of trying to translate this work um, to broader audiences. I have little people for the three A's that I chose not to include tonight. Um, but I did want to include this. This is, um, this is the tendency for those working in the climate and environmental movement to want to tell people why this is right and why we need to make change. And, that that is a very, it makes sense that we would be doing that. But it's, if we think about what I've been talking about, it tends to sort of, um, you know, override recognizing that who we're trying to connect with, and, I, and this can be scaled, by the way, this isn't just about one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, it it's, it's, um, brings up a lot of resistance and defenses for people. And the other tendency is to feel that we have to go on the other side and be cheerleaders and be really positive all the time and say, yeah, this is really great and come on board. And that's really exhausting, right? I mean, I feel exhausted just thinking about being a cheerleader because, again, it's like it's putting all the energy on you to try to get someone and motivate someone, right? But think about it this way in terms of engagement or in terms of conversation where it's really more of like a flow. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. So this is intended to be kind of a high level thing. But I want to just say again to remind us that however we're feeling is okay. So I don't want anyone to go and feel bad that they're a, a, a writer, R-I-G-H-T, which is the term for writing. Like, this is right, this is why you should do it. Because we want to make the world better, right? That's coming from a really beautiful, powerful place. What I'm offering are some tools that we can think of as helping us do like a martial art, right? So how do we, how do we design our work? How am I doing on time, by the way? Wonderful. Okay. So, so the question is, how do we design our work? This is a way I think about framing it. 
how do we cultivate the conditions that foster our imaginative creative capacity? So I know that's kind of a complicated phrase. What I mean by that is thinking about our work less as trying to motivate or change and more about how do we cultivate the context and conditions that allow what's already there, and I believe that it is, I believe that as humans, we have an innate need to be creative, to be connected, to be, uh, have efficacy, to have influence, to have impact. Many people feel out of touch with those things. They feel that they have no power, they have no impact, and therefore withdraw into the apathy. So if you imagine what climate work can look like, if it took this on board as its core strategy, what would that look like? And, I, and that's really a question for us to, to think about and to invite our own creativity, right? Because I also believe that as humans we have enormous unlimited creativity, but the question is how can we create the, those conditions that allow it to flourish, you know? And it would be great to hear some of your thoughts and responses and examples maybe of when you've had that experience when things feel like they really ignite. So again, what does this work look like if we address people's care? So I wanna just sort of end on this note, let's see. Right, so I was gonna talk about some of the projects I do and I'm not going to. Um, so what I wanna, I wanna end on this note with, um, what it, I know it's a weird time to be talking about this because it's a time when, you know, we're also f very angry um, and outraged and feel ripped off and, um, and, and, and some powerlessness. Um, so it might seem very paradoxical to think about what our work looks like if it's really um, informed and driven by compassion and compassion for ourselves, and compassion for those that we're working with. And, and seeing compassion not as something weak and soft, but fierce, right? The Dalai Lama um, had, had a quote where he, uh, he said something along the lines of, compassion is not a luxury, it's essential for human survival. And there's a lot of power in that, because again, keeping in mind what we've just been looking at, you know, these are very threatening, scary issues. People shut down. How do we reach them? How do we get through? One of the most powerful ways of disarming is having compassion for our humanity right now, our humanity. And when we have compassion for our own humanity, our own vulnerability, we are then, it, it's impossible for that not to be shared and felt amongst those that we're working with. And, and frankly, I believe that that is one of the, uh, a secret ingredient for activating. So keeping in mind that quadrant, we need the innovation, we need the technology, we need the systems thinking, we need the framing, we need the behavior change, we need the activists, we need people fighting on the front line, we need the you know, folks in North Dakota, we need the, act, you know, the, the taking action, putting your body on the line, we need all of that. And we also need a good infusion of fierce compassion to say, look, we're in this situation, it sucks, it's messed up, no one, we didn't, humans didn't mean this to happen, but now we've got an opportunity to change this. We have this incredible opportunity. But unless we, we stay connected with that softness, the vulnerability, the, you know, the anxiety, we won't be able to bring people as much into that activation, let's do it as much as we could be. So that's my, um, that's my invitation for us. That's my sort of tour through some insights that I hope can be helpful for supporting our own work in the space and relating with ourselves right now at this time. So I think I'll close at that and we'll, we'll have some more discussion. So thanks for your attention and your interest. I really appreciate it.
Thank you so much. Um, Renee, please, please, if you can stay for one little more minute. Um, we have like about five minutes left, so maybe okay. we can just go to the room and see if there are some questions for clarification. So just, just like not, not arguments or uh, new thoughts, but more like other things you want to clarify. I will come with the mic. Uh, my question is uh, the connection to apathy, um, because you gave some uh, idea about how to stay connected, and and uh, but but what uh, what's the, the idea when we when why why we're so apathic apathic I don't know how to say. So the way I'm relating with apathy is that it's a, f a defense mechanism. Does that make sense? A defense mechanism? So it's a psychological process where it's a strategy that we engage, un usually, un you know, it's unconscious, right? But it's a way for people to protect themselves from feeling intolerable conflict. Um, it's not at the conscious level. So um, there's, there's, depending on where you're at in neuroscience, there's ways of understanding the non-conscious and how we, um, sort of process information in various ways, but, but the, uh, the understanding that I'm presenting about apathy is very much that it's not a thing that we want to kind of take literally and take at face value. Is that a, some, a phrase that you use here, face value? No. So you don't take it as it is, right? It's a symptom of something going on underneath. It's a, yeah, there's more to the story, more to the picture. More like a mask. Yeah, right. So you really don't think there are people that just don't care? <laughs> um, I do think that people care about different things. And it depends on, um, I mean, we were speaking earlier about the kinds of experiences people have, right, that will influence how much we care. So it's very much in relation to where, how we're situated and what kind of, um, what we've been exposed to as far as with nature and with, you know, um, so I, I would never generalize and say everyone cares. But I also am trying to be a corrective against the tendency to think, overly think people don't care. I think that, yeah, people care about many different kinds of things. And that more often than not, there's a care that's there, but it's very buried under a feeling of absolute powerlessness just complete, like, what's the point? What difference is it gonna make? What, why should I even think about this? I've heard this hundreds of times in interviews with all kinds of people. And it takes some time to get there. It doesn't just come out right off the bat. It takes some time to get to that place where people will say, what difference is it gonna make? But then they go on to tell you all these things that they're feeling upset about. But then they go back to, well, you know, I'm just going to focus on this for right now. Ah, there's one more question. Ah. Um, this is kind of comment or request for clarification, but um, just thinking about the time thing, like it seems over the last 20 years, um, climate change has moved from being something, oh, it's way in the future to, mm. you know, oh, we must act now to, oh, it's too late, we're all doomed. It's sort of within right. about 20 years or something. And I find whenever climate change is spoken about, it's always urgent, 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 must be done now, you know, 2017 is the final year or whatever. But with the creativity, my personal experience is it's got to be, it's got to have a feeling of space and, and a feeling of mm. not being rushed, right. which is really difficult to combine with this feeling. It must be urgent, it must be urgent. Exactly. So, yeah, I just wanted to comment on that clarification. Yeah. yeah, that kind of relates to the poem I shared earlier, which is about slowness, but yet being active. So I'm, I'm interested in how can we be acting in an urgent way, but yet with spaciousness, if that makes sense. Hi. Um, as an environmentalist, how do you get people to actively do something? Because I can understand that you have a lot of frustrations about having all these interviews with people and knowing that they kind of care, but not really care enough right. to actually do something. How do you actually get people to do something instead of like, I know all these people came to this lecture, but how many people will actually do something after they've heard you talk and heard you talk mm -hmm. and heard all these people talk? 
Right. How do you make sure that people are actually going to do something about something that you really care about? Well, in the, in the second half of the program, it will be all about that, like how do we move through the apathy? Because right. You can already, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. How I do it. I ask a lot of questions, and I use um, tools to draw people out so that they actually speak their own so it's very much about drawing out as opposed to trying to get or pr pressure or persuade. It's drawing, asking really good questions about what people care about or what they're thinking about or what, how their day was or whatever. So drawing it out. But it's scaling that to a campaign message, a message or campaign or a strategy, it would be, um, it would look a little bit differently. It would be posing questions kind of in a way that invites people to reflect. So it's really not about trying to push. It's really about the inv inviting. One, one last question, and, and then we will have a break, and then we will move on to the... Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, you talk about compassion really greatly, but uh, this war between uh, compassion and the apathy that you just described almost seems like a holy war at this point. Hmm. It seems like time is running out, and I personally really feel that um, we're at the brink of collapse, and it might not work anymore. We might not be in time to save it, and that gives me a really big feeling of hopelessness. And I wonder, um, apathy is a really powerful force too. Mm -hmm. um, I am not convinced that compassion can, over can win from apathy, especially not in this time frame. Um, please give some positive words on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, okay. So it's not only about Compassion. I mean, that sounds really kind of weak to say, okay, let's go save the world with compassion. It's more like thinking about the tactics and the mechanisms that we use and how we can use them with some compassion, compassionately. So here's the reality, right? Like, regardless of what you think, humans are way more likely to make change, radical change, when they feel that they are accepted and it's safe and it's okay. That's just the reality whether you like it or not. So when you push, what you get met back with is usually a lot of resistance. You know, like those Chinese puzzles, those finger puzzles where you pull and it gets tighter and tighter. And so what I'm, what I'm recommending is to be fierce and be very direct and, and do what we need to do, right? But to experiment with ways of doing that that are... Um, are, are, are kind of um, recognizing that, that these are hard times. So, for example, to, to come, to approach people with some empathy and compassion to say, this is really hard, this is really difficult, this is really scary, can be very disarming. And people are more ready and willing to hear what you have to say and be more, you know, more available. So it's kind of like what I'm suggesting is a bit of, um, it's like a strategy. Right? It's a way, and I'm interested to know how this makes sense for the work you're doing, right? Because if, if you can imagine this um, being translated in that way. Um, so I know it sounds kind of lame to say, you know, let's save the world with compassion, but, but it's actually, yeah, I think that, um, that people are way more likely to engage when they feel that they're going to be successful, they're going to have impact. Otherwise, we just won't invest the energy. So hopefully we'll talk more about yeah. that. Thank you. We're going to have a break in 15 minutes, and then we'll come back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Great. OK. Um, the second half of this program, we are going to explore a bit deeper about what this kind of understanding of apathy means for how we can engage with well, the world. Um, and we're going to touch upon three themes. And the first theme is about bearing the unbearable. So if we look a bit deeper into these feelings of despair, these feelings of powerlessness, can we find like a different meaning? Can, can, can we find like opportunity to um, connect through these feelings? So um, we have this wonderful big panel with people from all different parts of society who are trying to engage. Um, with this theme, and I think all of you have experienced in some way feelings of despair. So I would love to invite you to share a bit how, how you, you, how you've been experiencing these kind of feelings and how you have found meaning in trying to bear it. So um, Princess Irene, I'm very happy you're here with us. You um, 
you're a founder of various foundations, like, like NatureWise, and uh, you are in engaging with, well, many, many people on how to reconnect with nature. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know, do you, do you rec recognize these kind of feelings of despair, and how do you deal with it yourself? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, not talking about despair of today, but the despair of uh, being a human being. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was very, very tired, and I had two jobs and four children to raise on my own. And I thought a little holiday, you know, not, uh, not really tired, but five days in the mountains will be enough. You know, that sort of feeling that you're so tired, you don't know tired anymore. So I went to the Swiss mountains where I had a little house and um, one morning I came out of the house and I didn't feel any distance between myself and nature. Absolutely no distance and I was part of it all and um, not so much part of, of what I saw but what I felt, the, the life force that flows through everything, through the, through the earth itself, through the mountains, through the grasses, through the flowers, through the animals to the rivers, and my own life force, and, and that, was, uh, that was one. And from that, um, from that oneness, or that life force, so much love an animated, it, yeah, you can say animated, uh, came through, that um, when I went back uh, home, I, um, I didn't know how to process that, it mm. was too much. And, in my work, they said you have to take uh, three months and the doctor also three months off because um, you know, it's sort of a break a breakthrough. I mean, you um, how do you call this? Well, mm. burnout. Thank you. And um, it wasn't really a burnout. It was it was that that experience that I had, and it had um, after three months it was not enough, and I had it. I needed a year, and mm. it was a year. Every morning I woke up with despair, and every night I went to bed with despair. And why? Because being a human being, how should I live? Mm -hmm. Because being a human being, I, would, I, I will always pollute. So how could I possibly want to pollute that beauty that I had experienced? So that, that, was, really, that was really a challenge. And um, so I went really down the pit. And uh, I knew when I reached the bottom, I'll, I'll come up again. That's, I, I knew that somehow. So that helps, but it, it took, it took uh, quite a time. And then one morning I woke up and I felt like something swimming around me, like undulating. And I got the image of dolphins. And I heard the words somehow, we know the sorrow of the world, but we do not carry her. And, and that made me realize I was carrying the sorrow of the world. I'm you know, being a human. You know, and um, and then somehow, um, well, first of all, I, I decided to go and see what the dolphins had to tell me, really. And that made me um, snap out of it, actually, and um, change the, the anger and the sorrow and the, and the, and the worth, worthlessness and all, all that you explained into action. And I started to write a book about it, which was, was uh, uh, received well and very badly, <laughs> um, because a lot of people didn't understand what I was talking about. But I wanted to share that experience with as many people as possible, because having experience like that, um, I thought, this cannot be only for me. It's too much. Uh, this is to share. So that's why I wrote that book, which was not quite understood. And... Um, and, and, and I, I started to, uh, I made a promise to, to the dolphins actually that I would start the nature college and work with people and reconnect people to nature because for me I understood that as we have separated ourselves so much from nature, um, we lost our own part of our own inner nature. So sustainability to me, the solution is not only the technical solutions but also the inner change and really, really allow yourself to feel your sorrow. I think if we really would dare to feel that sorrow that I have been through, um, we would change, the, we would change. We would, to the world, really we would do things. So if you would take in our own feelings very seriously, like, like deeply seriously what, it's, what it would mean, so if we don't um, 
ignore our own pain or say, well, it will pass or it's not that important. But if, if we really would explore what it means to us, there is an opportunity for transformation and change. Yeah, I think, if you I think it's very important to take our feelings really seriously and, and not to elope from your, your feelings and not to push them away because, because of that experience of the oneness and that I'm really, I know now that I'm part of the whole, that I'm part of, of, of that, yeah, that's like a horizontal level, that I'm part of the, uh, I'm the same as the ants, I can't do what an ant does and, I, and the ant can't do what I can. Hmm. But we all, we are there all together. I mean, this is really together. And that each and every one of us, um, with what we think and what we decide to do, we change the world in one way or another. Well, maybe if more people had voted, huh, N wouldn't have happened what happened now. You know, it's not, but it's not only voting, it's how you eat, uh, if you travel or not. I take traveling also very seriously. You know, um, if, if we would all eat, if we have to, eat meat just once a week, it would change enormously, it would change mm -hmm. a lot. But the thing is, take yourself seriously, and you are the tool of your life and of, of your road, so don't spoil that tool. So mm. take yourself seriously mm. in your feelings and in your health and in the way you do everything. Mm. And, and the only tool you have is you. Yeah. And, and you matter. I mean, we really create the future. Mm -hmm. We all create the future of this earth together. I think it's beautiful that we have that task. It makes it worth living, but we have to do it. So there's like an existential truth in this kind of feelings if you really explore it, and there's 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 meaning in it. Um, Renee, I I can see you nodding and writing down. I'm just wondering how you how you relate to this kind of experience. Oh, I'm I'm really moved by what you're sharing, and and I think I would say it's not only taking our feelings seriously, but uh, allowing ourselves to feel. So at an experiential level. Um, so the title of the talk, I called it Permission to Care. So it's about giving ourselves permission to feel and trust that we will not fall apart. I mean, we, there is a falling apart, but to trust in the resiliency that we will. But there's something important to say about um, feeling contained enough and held enough to feel. So in your story, I'm hearing that you were able to go there, right? That somehow you felt, and it sounds like your experience, you were feeling held by the world, by nature, right? I, I was held by that experience. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And so, so I think it's important for us to be mindful and sensitive to how do we co cultivate these conditions where we're able to give one another and ourselves permission to really, and, and part of that I think is sharing exactly what you've done, which is very brave, which is to tell your story and share it in a way, you know, and as you say, a lot of people may not know how to make sense of it, but, but, um, but by putting our, what's true for us out there, I think that's the most radical, political, powerful thing that we can do is to put it out there. Right. I, I, f I fully agree. I mean, it's not easy to tell my story here, but but uh, I have a dry mouth. <laughs> but um, it is. I think it's very very important that we do that. I, I agree 100 percent, Renee. Because mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, um, also tell other people why you do not eat meat or why you do eat meat or why you travel or not travel. If you look where your clothing comes from or how you treat animals, how you what you tell your children and don't tell your children. I mean, uh, how your relationships are. Tell each other, you know, share that. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't be shy about it. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's the things most near to your heart that are most difficult to share, but I think it's very important that we do it. It'll help the others. Mm -hmm. I'll just In also <laughs> add that I happen to have a powerful dolphin experience too, and I was remembering it as you were talking, <laughs> that they came to me as well. Um, yeah, when I was about 19, and that's a whole other story. But it was, there were some interesting parallels, so. Um, so I really appreciate your sharing that. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Wonderful. Imra, I was wondering, you were like a conductor and composer, and you're making uh, music on ecology and how we re relate to nature. Um, you told me that you also had like this kind of strong feelings of despair and that music helped you going through it. Can you say a bit more about these feelings and how you dealt with it? 
Yeah, well, it's, it started, uh, um, I think, four or five years ago that I got really conscious about uh, climate change and related uh, ecologi the ecological crisis. And um, and I, I couldn't cope with it myself in the way that I felt in all interaction I had with my friends and with family and with uh, people around me that there was always a kind of a distance um, because the complexity and um, um, the the hugeness of of e the ecological crisis where to start uh, in a in a conversation and i started uh, to do my own research more and more and trying to figure out ways to discuss it with people but it, uh, a lot of times it ended up having a kind of a fight about it um um and then i read uh, one book uh, this changes everything from naomi klein um i think a lot of people know it and I got really in, de in despair because of that, because it was just uh, such a book of facts, <laughs> uh, scientific facts. And I um, started to ask myself very personal questions because of that. Do I want children? Um, uh, what can I do with my life? And at the same time, I was, I was already composing and I was making music. And I, I also tried to, to make sense with the art I'm making. <laughs> um, and um, well, uh, in the despair, I, I felt very lonely at first, and I see this also in a, a lot of other people that they, it's so hard to communicate about it that you can f feel very alone in it. Um, and one day I woke up and I uh, was lying in my bed, and the window was a little bit open, and I saw a tree. It was uh, uh, just before the summer, and I saw a tree, and the light was falling in uh, from the sun. And it was so touching, only this few leaves and this tree breathing in a way with the wind. And, um, and this was the first time I felt such a direct, and I can really relate to your story in that sense, a very direct relation uh, to nature. And then I started to do some research by uh, having a garden, a little garden, and trying to grow my own vegetables. And I felt incredibly hypocrite and I, I started laughing about it a lot because uh, I would uh, discuss with people like we have to change and we have to stand up now etc and then I would uh, go to my little garden and then I would be totally confused about the beans not growing and, and <laughs> I didn't understand any of it so and then um, a few weeks later I, I uh, woke up again and then I thought but I'm a musician I'm a composer uh, I'm a conductor, I want to make sense, so let's try to, and I don't know how, but let's try to bring all these f uh, feelings of despair and, and uh, loneliness, and, uh, uh, but also um, courage. Uh, let's br bring that to, to uh, uh, something living, compositions, and let's try to communicate with the music about uh, the the feelings uh, the, about my own existence actually mm -hmm. and 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 see if music and arts can help to relate to that together and to con mm -hmm. really connect. Yeah. Okay, and 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 now you are. I mean, now you now you're making music. You you. I do still don't have a. <laughs> I don't have any idea how I should do it, and I, I every day I wake up with a lot of. Uh, positivity and energy because uh, it's it's a, a beautiful journey hmm. and it, it helps me to to um, well actually the day that I woke up and I saw the tree I m m made also a, li a mind sh shift that helps me a lot in the way that uh, before that morning I looked at it like um, the we are destroying nature so we have to fix it and I don't know how but um, from that morning on, I, um, uh, I'm trying to see it the other way around, uh, as if nature is asking us to change ourselves. And for me, this really helps to, to cope with things that are happening and see also value in, I think, the time of revolution we are in, um, uh, to see value in, in uh, different things that are mm -hmm. happening. And even the election in, in America, I can kind of relate in, in a way, uh, so some part of me can relate in a positive way. Maybe this is necessary to really change as mm. a human species. So you're yeah. kind of changing your, your world view um, and to, to adjust to this kind of feelings and things that, that are happening in the world. 
to make sense of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also to use um, the, the arts and the music as um, uh, non-judgmental, hmm. um, but very much connecting uh, and creative way of, of hmm. coping with these feelings. And this helps me a lot. Wonderful. I mean, yeah. Um, and, and, um, nature is asking us to change in, inside, and I, I think so too. Um, and nature helps us so much. Uh, you know, this morning I went running outside because I was so um, through each other. <laughs> I was so upset, and um, and then I go outside uh, to be healed actually by nature, yeah. and it's like my best friend. You know, and and the power of healing that is in nature is incredible. So that's also something that, that, that um, we have to keep in mind. We are not there, we are part, but we are part of nature. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's be with nature also, because it's, it, it's really nature is a power for healing. Mm -hmm. And I think also in a more technical way, most of the solutions are already in nature, to be found in nature. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful. Let's try to research soil and research forest and, and see that all the answers are already there. So nature is then like a forest that enables us to bear this kind of unbearable, feelings or things that are, that, are, that, yeah. that are happening. It carries. Yeah. 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 It, hel it holds us. Yeah. Pelle, you are you're working with a civil society. You're trying to motivate people. You're trying <laughs> to bring about change. How do you deal as a campaigner with, with, with these kind of feelings and emotions and overwhelm? Yeah, so this one triggers a lot, obviously. Um, so... I, I was thinking of a key moment in my life. I, I've done a bit of work, um, sort of campaign work, but I've also been engaged in uh, sustainable activism as a facilitator. Um, so I work a lot with people that are super engaged, that may even be too engaged um, for their own good. And so uh, quite a critical uh, aspect of the work, I think, is to sustain ourselves in, for the long haul. And um, as a facilitator, I, w I was doing a process in, in England a few years back, and um, I was a facilitator, but there's no way you cannot participate in this kind of work yourself, because it, it raises a lot of questions. And um, one of the exercises we did was, um, if nothing you do is ever enough, what can you do? And we use that as an exercise to stimulate conversation between activists that are very engaged and know full well that whatever they do, whatever they do, it's not going to be enough. And that, that day triggered a lot of emotion and we had other things that were going on as well and people were getting really deep into the process, personally as well. And I remember very well that we were sitting by the fire at night and it was, it was dark, it was a beautiful starry night um, and I got involved in a conversation with somebody who um, sort of challenged me in my assumptions about the work I'm doing. And he, he was coming from, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dark Mountain Project, but a bit of that kind of thinking, which is really, uh, it's, a, it, it's also a coping. What uh, is it? Can you uh, yeah, explain? I'll, I'll explain. Um, it's a way of sort of accepting, actually, that we are in a situation that we might be beyond repair and dealing with grief, um, not as campaigners trying to change the world, but sort of retreating from engagement and reshaping it in a different way through the arts, through critical thinking, philosophy, um, and building a community that is sort of setting out to find a way in a world that is lost. And I was challenged by this perspective a lot because I come from, like, I, I engage a lot. I, I try to sort of build the movement and uh, I'm very political. Uh, I try to motivate people, uh, build strong groups, uh, build campaigns. Um, but I think, I think that conversation pointed out to me that I was doing that from an attitude of, of fighting and actually beneath all that fighting was a sense of despair. Uh, was realization in that conversation where he said, well, actually, don't you, th don't you really think that it's already lost? And then at that moment I felt, yes. Um, but it really opened up a thinking process. Um, and, and at some point I think sort of the realization came that there is uncertainty about the outcome of this process. We cannot control the outcome. 
And we are trained as campaigners to think in results in, in this culture, actually. We, we are very result-oriented. So we want to control the outcome, but maybe we cannot. But there is intrinsic value to the things that we are doing right here, right now, together with other people. So there, there I find a lot of consolation in that intrinsic value, that sort of finding my role, finding my voice, doing the things that I do, that is meaningful in and of itself, and that creates humanity between me and other people. So that's, that's my sort of response to despair, is to find my role, what can I do? How can I engage others, inspire others, and work together with them? And it's more, more about the here and now, and not about the results of far away, or... Not to say that one and a half degrees is not important, <laughs> by, mm. by the way, but um, we get, sometimes we get fixed only on that, but it's also really important to see the value of collaboration and being in the moment with people that care and want to make a change. Mm. Thanks. And Manu, you, um, you are hosting workshops. It's called the Carbon Conversation. And uh, you're actually bringing this into practice. Just mm -hmm. in, a, in a couple of meetings, you have like a kind of a journey with, with people along how to relate to this. Can you tell us a bit more about that? What, what, what kind of journey is that in those workshops? Um, <coughs> well, a lot of it relates back to what Renee earlier mentioned and, and some of the other stories as well. We give people a chance and a safe space to explore what it really is that drives their everyday behavior. And it's not about climate change, really, at first, and not in the end as well. Um, so we just ask them, why do you eat what you eat? And people tell stories, because my mother liked this, because the shop is nearby, because I don't have money for ch uh, more expensive food. And it's just that first step in recognizing how we humans do things. And then obviously also recognizing that there's no way we can live without polluting in the current system. And then move beyond that and reconnecting um, with a source of creativity, like what is, what are the, the ambitions, what, what, how, do you, how do you, one of the most important questions is how would you like to feel about your everyday behavior? Because if you allow yourself to feel and you understand that maybe through some stories other people share, I think we can feel the power of that. If, if, you know, if we share our personal stories, you get reminded of your own personal story, right? So it's a safe space. And then... Um, it's just um, a matter of discovering what truly drives your everyday behavior and then making a deliberate choice, once again, of this, if this is making you happy. And one of the workshops, it's six workshops, each, each dealing with a certain theme. And one of the workshops is about consumption. And a lot of people realize that more consumption and more money is not making them more happy. Um, and then, of course, the question is, what will make you more happy? And we, we, we give some practical, some research, some, some options to choose from. But it's always the choice of the participant. Uh, what really appeals to emotions, what makes me happy, or more happy, or, or more comfortable, or whatever. Uh, or more genuine, sometimes. I mean, it's, it's the, the personal values and emotions, once mm -hmm. again. Um, so carbon conversations, or klimaatgesprekken as we call them, is a series of six workshops. The first one, how do you relate to this unbearable problem? What's your first reaction? What's your everyday um, integration of this awareness? Second is, how do you live? Third is, how do you travel? I've, a few people have mentioned that traveling, do you do this consciously? Um, or do you do this because you want to share a great holiday story with your with your colleagues, or maybe are a little bit ashamed if you don't have that story. I mean, these are things that are important to recognize first before they can transform. And then obviously it also encourages if you hear a few other people who are at least on the, uh, looking at the world at the same thing or having the same kind of dilemmas. Because in, in the pre-interview you asked me, do you have a few practical tips? One of the things that is, is, in the, um, is practical Really, it's just acknowledging the dilemma. It's more practical to say, yes, it's a dilemma between time, money, in my case, three kids, and the environment. To do this allows room for exploration and transformation. If you make it a zero-one, most people just say, okay, I'll go for the zero, and most people 
become apathic, but it's not an apathy. It's just it's a it's a too difficult of a choice. So you may have to. The practical tip: if you talk to anyone about this, recognize the real dilemmas here, because if you say, well, time is really not a dilemma if you're trying to save the planet, right? I mean, one is more important than the other. Then you're really saying to that other person, make a zero or one decision, and most likely they will make the zero decision. Mm -hmm. So now I, I hear you talking about how to deal with people who are already willing to, to explore and to think about this and to engage with this. But now mm -hmm. I would like to talk more about denial, like hardcore denial, such as Trump's denial. Can you, um, just add something to what Ed, yes, know? please. So yeah. around carbon conversations. So carbon conversations was um, designed by a British psychotherapist who is also a climate activist. Uh -huh. And a lot of what I was talking about is relates and in some ways informed by her work, Rose, Rosemary Randall, um, where um, how what you beautifully described is these inquiries. Mm -hmm. So each meeting, it's, it's very much around inquiry, which comes out in part from this practice of motivational interviewing that Roe introduced me to, that comes out of the public health sector. How do you have conversations to change behavior around really like addiction and really hard behavior changes? That it's found that when you ask people precisely these questions, how do you, would, how would you like to feel mm. about your life? That's, that's a beautiful example of a, the kind of inquiry that's compassionate that draws us out. And, and I'm interested in actually taking what we can from that approach and seeing how we can apply it across contexts as well. So, for example, in the kind of work you're doing and we're all doing, what does it look like um, to take some of that wisdom? So I just wanted to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So if we think about denial, like, like Trump, like people who are actually saying climate change is not happening or it's not through human beings, or um, um, it's okay because climate has always changed. So, you know, th th those, those kind of arguments. So, so how, how do we deal with that? And how do you deal with those kind of people? Pelle, maybe you, you can say something about campaigning and how mm. you relate to that. Yeah, I, I think this is very, very, very important. Um, and I was very stimulated by this part of, uh, of the workshop, I think. Um, because I think there's an interplay what's going on at the individual level and on, on the political level. And I think that dimension we haven't touched upon, but I think there's also a social sanctioning going on of being able to deny it. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's, there's, I'm a campaigner, so I look at sort of like, how does power work? How does sort of certain stories get into the world and what, what kind of interests are behind that? And I would say that we live in a culture where very powerful interests have actively promoted disinformation, uh, doubt, um, and also sort of outright denial, like Trump. And, you know, whether we like it or not, but people look to authority, people look to political figures, to uh, scientists that are bought, um, and also incorporate it in a sort of a rationalization. Well, there's still a lot of discussion going on, so... You know, like, what can I do? It's fine. Um, so the interplay between what's going on on the ind individual level and to, to really understand that people are, are, are blocking there. But also, like, there's the campaigning part to actively seek out, like, how does this work? How, is it, how can it be that ExxonMobil knew in the 70s and has paid all sorts of uh, organizations to, to run that story for them? And then now, 30, 40, 50 years on, uh, we're still struggling with the, with the discussion, whereas we should have started really having the cultural narrative, like this is real, we need to act, and we need to help each other to understand and to act on it. So I think definitely there's, there's lots to learn mm -hmm. as well for campaigning organizations, how to engage the individual. Um, but also I've, I think we have a very in, uh, important role to to also see how powerful interests are actively promoting this kind of denial. Mm -hmm. So I'm triggered by the thing about cultural narratives. So uh, Rene, can you, can you say a bit, a, bit, a bit more about that? Like, like how how is our culture being, um, or how how do we reinforce narratives? Mm -hmm. Like like 
denying narratives about climate change and right. how do we do that in, in everyday life? Right. Well, I really like your language of social sanctioning. That's a very elegant way of putting what I was talking about earlier, that, that it's socially produced. Um, and that we do that through uh, how we interact and the language we use. I think I would, um, so my position on the production of denial from industry, I take, um, I, I try to also bring in, so it's like there's the production and the deliberate confiscation, you know, co co the confusion. But I also believe that we, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's so hard to come to terms with that there's something to be said for a sort of um, kind of an unconscious collusion. Do you know that term to collude with something where you're sort of unconsciously agreeing or joining forces with something? So I feel like what we're seeing is a collusion at a, mm -hmm. at a mass scale, right? Where um, we're all sort of participating in this fantasy um, because in a lot of ways it's easier to do that. And what, what so, kind of fantasy? Of de denial, mm -hmm. of denial. Um, psychology teaches us that, that part of us wants to believe it's not true, right? That's right. And then there's industry who buys uh, deniers, so, so it provides us with this information, so that's also part of the puzzle. So what happened in the, one of the groups, which you probably also already experienced once in your life or, or more, is that one of the participants said, well, we're not sure about all this, are we, yet? I mean, why should I uh, change my diet, my this, my that, be, be, be because of something that's not sure when will happen in the future, etc. And the way the facilitator reacted was not, you're wrong, I have better information. She said, wow, wouldn't it be great if you were right? Please share your information the next time you come with you and do your research and teach us something because we have different sources, but you know, we don't have the wisdom. So what happens in that process is that someone does his own research instead of trying to defend against someone else who's saying, okay, you're, you're better or worse or you're defending me or you're attacking me. That person get back into the group and said, because it was a safe group, I've done my research, and yes, I found a few sites, but they were sort of dodgy. <laughs> um, and, um, and I found a lot more sites with scientists, with institutions, with this, with that, who said the other way around. So it was hard for me to read that, but... So I think there's a lot to say that we need to work together on this, and mm -hmm. that campaigners need to inform the good information and to expose the disinformation, and that psychologists need to use their wisdom practically, and we all can, just to ask people, but respect them up front. Mm -hmm. You know, wouldn't it be great if that would be true, because that would make it all easier. Mm -hmm. And then, how can you, how, where do you get your information, and please t teach us. I mean, don't be a know-it-all, or a finger pointer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I so, think it's yeah. really campaigners working with psychologists in collaboration is what the world needs urgently, right? that they, these shouldn't be two separate areas. Psychologists aren't necessarily the most practical people, so, right, and, and so campaigners also kind of might have to be challenged in some introspective ways. I'm just saying that these are very different kinds of types that are attracted to these fields, and it's so complementary, it's so needed to connect them. And I just wanted to mention the story reminded me of someone I interviewed who's a Republican in the middle of the country for a project um, on understanding Republican views about climate change, who's a climate skeptic, and he said, if I knew that climate change was real, I would become a hardcore like climate activist. And this was a, like a working class kind of small business owner in, in Illinois, and in the Midwest, and that really stood out to me, it was very poignant, because it felt to me that what he was kind of saying, he was kind of indirectly expressing this profound dilemma. Like, part of him kind of wanted or knew, but he didn't feel that he could really go there. Yeah. Hmm. Can, can well, I? we we kind of need to move on. Uh, it's already 10. Uh, um, uh, so the last thing I wanted to ch talk about is, is, is about change. So if maybe you all could just um, share one, one kind of tip or wisdom or idea with us, like what, what kind of change do we need to seek and, and where is the opportunity for, ch for, for change? Like something hopeful <laughs> to rip off. Yeah. Something, <laughs> <hopeful>. something hopeful. 
<laughs> Who wants to start? To me, yes. for the changes within ourselves. Okay. And then that's, that's really our homework. That's where our homework lies. It's not only the technical side, it's not the outside, it's here, it's inside. So, so what do I have to do when I'm doing my homework? <laughs> <laughs> right, what I said, I think take, take your feelings seriously and know that you're part of a whole. Know that you're part of a whole, you're part of nature. So you're not above it, we're not the owners, we are partners and participants of the earth. So find your own way, because there's not one way, to live that. It's not, it's hmm. not, it, that's not an easy one. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> but but fi fi find that way. I mean, um, um, the change is, I think, that you, you matter. That every, every person has to do its own work and, and, and find your own way in, in, this, in, this, whole, in this whole challenge. And, and w your, your example will, will convince other people and, and you don't have to convince. I, I don't feel like convincing at all. Hmm. Uh, but to, to live your own way of, of life and then, and then it, yeah, people will see it and will find it interesting and ask and or, or, or just do their own thing. Thank you. But it's you. It's mm. you. Yeah. It's not someone else. It's you. Renee. Um, so I guess I would say um, it's about recognizing the human, speaking to and recognizing and accessing that part of us as human beings that um, is capable of so much more than we imagine and know. And, and really practicing as much as you can, seeing each person as, as almost like a, um, a seed. And that our role, our position, again, is not about convincing or motivating, it's really about drawing forth and evoking that, what that is in us that wants to feel connected and, and, and practicing that kind of compassion and empathy but it does begin with ourselves. So however we're feeling about our own experience is going to influence any interaction we have with any other person. And so there is, unfortunately, we can't get around the inner and the outer. There's just no way. And I actually think this is a really exciting moment because I think we're, there's a collective recognition of this that's happening that I've never seen before over decades, you know, the, the inner and the outer w work. Well, I think there's a, a, a um, for me at least, but I think that there's a challenge in um, involving people that are not in your natural circle. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and involving these people can only happen if you, you yourself are open to uh, others. So um, for the example of the elections in America, we're going to have the same in half a year in, in the Netherlands. I don't know anyone who votes uh, PVV. No one. Uh, for me, it's going to be the challenge of meeting uh, some of them, <laughs> as if they're, they're not a group, but uh, some of those people, <laughs> and then and try to um, be interested in their stories. And, and um, also, I think... Um, with the despair, there's also, uh, uh, if, if you go through it, th there also comes a very deep, sensitive feeling of hope. Mm. And hope is not the same as positivity or thinking that it's going to be right. That's totally different. But some uh, very deep feeling of hope that uh, this, what is happening around us and uh, what's happening with us in this hall is something we all do together and uh, uh, go through together and that it is no coincidence that we live together in this time and that it, it's an incredibly beautiful uh, time we live in. So we should uh, see the value in, in all small things, I think. So, and this is really a challenge. Yeah. It's not easy, but see the value in, in the vegetable and in the, uh, you know what I mean. So yeah. in creating value in Everything that's around us will yeah. already solve a lot. So it's like looking with different eyes to, to the world around us. Yeah, see yeah. how beautiful this yeah. actually yeah. still is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Pelle. Yeah, so um, 
great one again. Um, <laughs> change. Um, so the former executive director of Greenpeace, uh, Kumi Naidu, um, yeah, was quite an inspiration to me in this sense. And he talked a lot about courage and courage as something that is, cur is contagious, that works sort of to inspire others to do the same, to take a step. And I think we've been talking a lot about the psychology of climate change, but there's also social psychology that we need to take into account. And I think a lot of the work to make change is work in groups, is work together with other people that are like-minded or are very different, but you can find them uh, on a particular issue or a goal. And I wanted to share a bit about my experience sort of with some friends that are present here to build something called the Dutch Climate Movement over the last two years where I think we all came from that recognition that we need to collaborate um, above and beyond the organizational labels or the particular projects or the initiatives. Um, we need to create a feeling that we are all in it together and that we can learn from each other and we can create change together. And what we've done over the past two years is we've organized every half a year um, a climate weekend, a training weekend where 80, 100, 120 people over the weekend come together uh, to get to know each other, um, to feel that they have a safe space to talk about issues that we've been talking about tonight, um, to create projects together, to learn about each other's projects and feel more sort of support and active uh, solidarity for other things that are going on. And I think that's, that's really powerful, to create that kind of vehicle together that you know, like you can come if you're not active, you can come if you're very experienced, but you feel when you enter a room at a climate weekend that everybody is there to make a difference and they're all interested in what you're doing and how, you, how, how they can help out. Um, so I think a huge part of the puzzle is to create these kind of spaces, to create vessels for people to become active and to feel that they're held by others. Thanks, beautiful. Manu, for you, the last words about yeah. how to change, um, make change. Thank you. <coughs> I, I think um, it's a lot about finding your own personal answer and response to despair and, and, and anxiety and difficult emotion. If you do find your answer, a, a few things will happen. Um, one, you become a better communicator. If you're scared and say to other people, I'm really scared, please help us. That's not a very attractive message. Um, two, if you find your own personal answer, you will become more relaxed and happy. Even as a world that is collapsing, if you can find a way to still connect with your happiness, with your creativity, which we all do in various ways, um, you become a person that is more of an inspiration or an attractive person to other people. Um, and an example, maybe, instead of hmm, I don't want to give up everything and, and be unhappy and be depressed. And this is a powerful mechanism. I mean, a lot of people who voted for Trump today are like Trump, are white, older men. So there's a powerful psychological mechanism that we do listen more or connect more to the people who are like us. So find your own personal answer to despair, to uh, being afraid, etc., and you become a person that people will connect to more likely. Because, and thirdly, and this was a real eye opener to me, and it happens to me all the time. But now I'm trying to fix this. If you say to people, "I'm really scared," I think it will all turn bad, and they are your friends. They might respond to comfort you and say, "It won't be that bad. The government will solve it." So unintentionally, you invite them maybe to not recognize your feelings and actually do a little bit of climate denial. That was an eye-opener to me, and it happened also today to me, because on, today on Facebook I posted in a climate group, this is a really sad day for climate activists, isn't it? And someone, probably f with good intentions, said, well, why would it be a sad day? Maybe this and that. And I felt a little bit ignored. But it was probably from good intentions, like, okay, let's make a positive thing. So it happens all the time. So find your own personal answer to despair, to, to chaos, to, to whatever you're scared of, and become a better communicator. And, um, and um, yeah, like that. That would, that would bring so about personal yeah. change in yeah. your life.
So we are about to close the program, and we're also going to have a, like an like an interact interactive musical improvisational uh, exercise to give voice to our feelings. Um, is that like excitement or uh, <laughs> despair? Help! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I promise this is a safe space. It's, it's a very safe space. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we do that, are there any 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 uh, other advices people want to give each other? Like any any tips or any things about how how we can comfort each other in bringing change? Or has everything been said? Okay. Imre, I would like to. Oh. Ah, sorry. Ah, I didn't see that. Sorry. Um, I was just thinking, um, I think the wisest decisions we can make for ourselves are coming from a space of um, kind of relaxation when you are the most wise and not being forced to do the right thing or forced to, you know, you want change, but you don't know how, and then you're not relaxed. And if you're in this anxious and depressed state, um, you're, you're not really able to think clearly, actually. Th and for me, s myself, it's now important to um, work on the inner strength first and not be harsh for yourself to, um, to push, someone said. And and it's also related to what you said earlier, like uh, give it time too, and then in, in, and then on the longer term you will be able to do the right thing, maybe or the um, wise thing for yourself. But things should be in balance, I think, for your own for your own good and for the good of the uh, whole community. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. There's like another hand. At the oh, the many hands. Two, two more tips, and then we will Hi. continue. Um, for me, it's, uh, if you think of the big picture, it's pretty scary, as we all think. But I find it easier to think of um, every decision you make in the day, every minute, every second, uh, when you're at work and you're walking towards a rubbish bin, do you choose which bin do you choose to put your cup in? Do you take a plastic cup or whatever glass uh, water jar to work, or do you use a, a plastic uh, um, paper coffee cup, you know. All those little decisions make, a, make an impact and uh, I think it starts with the small things. Otherwise, it's just a big uh, dramatic mess in your head, right, which you can't solve. So that's how, that's how I try and deal with it. Thanks. And one, one very last person very at the back. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Um, what I would also like to add to the, what was said last, not only if you um, <coughs> say you're scared or if you s say something about fear, you give some, somebody the opportunity to deny climate change. What I've also learned so far on my spiritual path is that fear is the opposite of love. And when people are in fear, that's what some people, kind of evil people, want us to be. So um, the opposite of fear is love. So as long as we like stay positive and don't really express too much that we're afraid and like keep hope. I also feel that that is a, a good way to go. Thank you. Hope was the last word. That's a beautiful word. Imre, can I give the floor to you to, to yes. make a closing yeah. of this evening? Yeah. Otherwise, you're uh, performers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. Um, I got 10 minutes and we're going to make a musical composition together <laughs> um, to somehow make a summary of what we spoke about and thought and felt uh, this night. I have no idea how it's going to be like, so I have the exact same fear now as you have. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> um, I want to start with... Um, one sentence uh, that's part of, um, or that's the title sentence of a choir pr project I'm doing now to, uh, with the chamber choir. And we are giving a concerts in a few weeks, so the advertisement is outside. But um, uh, there's one sentence um, which comes from Africa, from the Sahel Desert, and is um, in English, the earth is tired. 
And in African, that is Kassar, um, um, you can repeat. Kassar, Mie, La, Gai. Kassar, Mie, La, Gai. Very good. This is going to be the lyrics for uh, the first part <laughs> of the music. Um, I want to ask you to... Um, we're going to make a little bit of chaos in here, because now it's as if uh, you are a performer and, and I'm the audience, but I want to join you. So can you stand up and, and use the middle here and the sides and um, still have a little bit of view on me, but... Great. So, we're going to do a little exercise and it takes like 30 seconds. So the lyrics is Kasser Miela Gahi, remember. And you're going to say it in a certain way. It can be very low, it can be very high, it can be very slow, it can be very fast. And try to then uh, involve the discussion we had at the very beginning of this evening uh, about how are you feeling. So you're going to communicate with each other, not with me, with each other in, in a musical way. Only this sentence and it takes 30 seconds and then I do this and then we're silent. <laughs> Good luck. Kasser uh, guy is the sentence. There we go. Great. So it's, it's crucial that you uh, at the same time start communicating with each other and uh, look at the conductor uh, because we also have a next step. Uh, but we can improve this a little bit. So I hear now chaos. That's good. I want chaos. But I also hear, um, I say it one time and then I get, get a little bit insecure because I don't know what to do next. And so I will just say it again and again. That's what I hear it a little bit. But be creative in the way that you can use only one character or only one word. Kassar! Kassar! Etc. So put away your uh, awkwardness and fear and let's try for 20 seconds. There, go, there we go. Great, this already sounds much more interesting for me. <laughs> Great, now I uh, want to take the next step and therefore we have to do a little exercise. We're gonna make, we're all gonna sing and we're all together so it's okay. Um, <laughs> we're all gonna sing and if I am down here with my hands then we make one big chord. So you choose how high or how low it is. Let's try it out, we do the chord and if we do again like this then it's silent again. You can use the vowel you want, so it doesn't have to be uh, the consonant you want, it doesn't have to be kassar. Huh? Um, let's try another note, so maybe you did the low one now, now you do a high one, etc. There we go. Now we're going to do this five times, and the first time is a total cluster, uh, all individual choices. The second time we try to listen a little bit to each other and we try to take over from the neighbors. And the third time we do it from the people next to that. And the fifth time we have one big chord. So we're going to listen to each other and take over so it's going to be in a certain harmony. There we go. Five times.
Great. And that some people start laughing is very natural. It's okay. You can do it. Um, the last and third step is uh, I want you to think of uh, one children's song that, that you have good memories with. So one children's song. can be one little melody. Now we're going to do a performance together. And I really want you to not look at me, but face another way. And um, to end it off, um, we will start with a Kasser Miele Gahi, and we, it will be total chaos and panic, maybe even, and overwhelming feelings and overwhelming sound for this little hall. Then after that, we're going gradually, and I will help you with it, to those chords, and we do it five times. So first, a very big chord. Strange chord, the second time more with each other and we start listening and listening more and the fifth time it's in harmony. And then after that, if we have had this chord, you can softly sing for yourself your children's song. <laughs> Very softly. If we have finished that, we are silent and I will read one text about hope that I think is very fitting to today. Um, so this is going to be the composition. Take yourself seri seriously. We are all musicians. Good luck. I'm going to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kasimie Legahi. Court, 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 court. Children's song. Nothing. Hope. Hope is a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us, or we don't. Hope is not a prognostica prognostication. It's an orientation of the spirit. You can delegate that to anyone else. Hope, is, hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy when things are going well, or the willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for early success, but rather an ability to work for something to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. It is hope, above all, that gives us strength to live, and to continually try new things, even in conditions that feel and seem as hopeless as ours do, here and now. In the face of this absurdity, life is too precious a thing to permit its devaluation by living pointlessly, emptily, without meaning, without love, and finally, without hope was written by Vaclav Pavel from the Czech Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your presence, for your engagement, for your sharing, uh, for your vulnerability and for your strength. We have drinks. 
Uh, thank you, René Letsman, Princess Irene, Imre Ploeg, Manu Busgos, and Pelle Berting, and all the people who are here tonight. Please. <laughs>